The main problem is small, medium-sized enterprises. So that's where we need to get our, our sub-African, sub-Saharan African countries in. Whereas now, sub-Saharan Africa, small, medium-sized enterprises is only 10% of our economy. So we need business people who can go in, make the investments, build these small, medium-sized enterprises, create jobs that pays taxes so that our governments can have the tax dollars to build our schools and run our hospitals. Because if they don't, they will need aid. And we need to move away from this dependency by aid. Okay, so there is a lot more stuff I can talk to you about, but let me just come straight and talk to you now about what we've been doing. We have decided really that aid and charity is not the best way to help countries transform themselves. For those reasons, and based on the data. Because it creates a dependency culture. It just doesn't help the, the governments. So the question is, is are there are there enterprises that we can do, that we can invest in, that can tackle poverty, that can tackle social problems? Can we can we be creative enough to design businesses that can tackle poverty and tackle social issues? And maybe also tackle some of the environmental issues that we have around. And the answer is yes. And and we this is a growing area. And, and, and about 10 years ago, with some other friends, we started a, a network called the Transformational Business Network. It's a network of about 2,000 disillusioned philanthropists. Because when you've got a little, when you've got some money, the easiest thing to do is just write a check and forget about it and think that you've done your bit. But really, it doesn't change anything on the ground. Right? So this is a group of people who get on planes, who fly to a country they have a passion for, who walk the slums go into the township, go into the slums, find businesses that have the capacity to take on a new investment, willingness to have a new business plan wrapped around them, where we're putting patient capital for 10 years, 12 years, 15 years, to help them grow from employing three people to 100 people, 200 people, or in one of our cases is now 5,000 people. They employ 5,000 people in the slums. We have 5,000 families having jobs. That ultimately will as well will transform our communities. But to do that, it's, it's difficult. You know how hard it is to invest in Uganda. But Uganda is one of the easier countries, easier, relatively speaking, in Africa. There are more difficult countries that we invest in in Africa than Uganda. So it requires a kind of some courage, some risk taking to go in and, and a lot of time spent on the ground mentoring and encouraging these businesses to grow. But it's designing businesses, thinking outside the box. It's not about making money. We, for, for those of us in the transformation business know, we make more money sitting here nicely in, in, in the UK rather than getting on planes and going spending time in the slums. So, so it's not about making money, it's about how do you make an enterprise that gives you a, a small return, because it has to be profitable, because if it doesn't become profitable, it becomes a charity. So we're going to design it so that it becomes profitable. Otherwise, we just go back to doing charity and aid, right? But can those businesses also address poverty and social issues? And from, from investing our own money 15 or so years ago, some of us have now left uh, our day job and we're now running a whole lot of different types of funds. And these are, are some of the funds that are there now that can address, that are, are addressing poverty issues. And, and this thing is just grow uh, and, and it's a very uh, fast growing uh, area. And as you can see, these are, these, these are now significant amounts of money that, that are now being applied uh, in various countries, in various regions, to build businesses once and for all. To build, to, to make investments in local entrepreneurs and help them grow 
and scale uh, their businesses. So this is where I started. Uh, I made a trip to South Africa uh, and didn't think I could take my children to uh, a five-star safari game park without showing them the other part of South Africa. So we spent half a day in the township just outside Cape Town. And what I saw that is illusion. That was the beginning of the journey for me. And if you like, that was a Damascus Road experience where God was just challenging me about using my gifts and my talents in a different way. And that was really the beginning of the book. Long story, we ended up going to one of the poorest regions in South Africa, in the Eastern Cape, uh, a region with 80% unemployment, 30% HIV AIDS. Now, as a philanthropist, I could have gone to build school, which is good, and we need to do more of that. Could have, I could have built an orphanage, that would be good too, we need to do more of that. I could have built a clinic, that's also a good thing to do. But you know what? It wouldn't change anything. That's the problem. It would not change that community, that district. And what was needed was for me to throw a big enough stone into this pond that can create a ripple to stimulate economic activity to bring transformation to that region. So in a long story in the end, we, we ended up buying 22 farms, degraded farms, 40,000 acres of land, uh, and turning it into a nature reserve, in a wilderness reserve, uh, uh, because we want to run an eco-tourism project that we can bring foreign tourists in, and when they come in and spend money, that's what you know, we can use to create jobs and bring transformation. So that's what we've done. We, we, we then have a fence about 70 odd kilometers, uh, elephant proof fencing, reintroduced game, big game in there for the first time in 150 years. Uh, and, and this is now a, a, an up and running uh, project uh, for us in South Africa. Using local uh, materials and local people wherever we can, and then now also engaging in, in a whole lot of, of uh, animal conservation. That's been no big game there in 150 years. So, so part of what I've discovered we, we, we went intentionally to tackle the poverty in the area, but as a byproduct, I uh, got to understand how challenging uh, the whole conservation story is and, and, and how we're destroying our environment and our, 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 our wildlife. Uh, and then but this was the main reason we went. Our people used to live in those kinds of uh, huts today living in uh, these types of, of, of houses. Uh, uh, coming from a biotech pharmaceutical background, I've got a strong interest obviously in healthcare. But healthcare is very difficult to measure. But healthcare is very correlated to housing. If you improve housing, health improves. So our measurement is on housing. So we kind of separate the market. And for us, we talk about standard housing. Standard housing is concrete floor, concrete walls, water, electricity, indoor bathroom, flush toilet sort of panel. Over time with our investment, we want to know what percentage of people start to have standard housing. Because when they have standard housing, we know their health will improve. Right? So yeah. that's really an important thing for us. And we haven't got time to, 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 to talk through this, but we measure a bunch of different metrics. So apart from our profit and loss and, and balance sheets and on quarterly basis, we want to know, is our investment making any change to our community? Is it really healthy? So one of the things we measure is male, female, we measure average salary per month, uh, excluding managers, because they distort. So we want to know, at the bottom, our lowest pay, is that rising year on year? Because if it isn't, we're just doing good. We're not really doing real transformation. And then, as you can see, we also measure the amount of income tax that's paid. Is that increasing? Because if we're not increasing the tax base, we're just do this. We're not really helping the government uh, of that country to, 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 to make fundamental changes. Then we measure the number of people in standard housing over time. Uh, we also measure the number of kids who go to tertiary education. Because we want to know. Can we really help people to change their, their, their physical discipline? 
Now, us men are the worst, right? We're the most irresponsible. Because when we pay salaries to these men, before they get home, how will it get spent? Alcohol, gambling, whatever. Right? Women, this is what, microfinance only works with women. It doesn't work with men, right? Because the men are useless at, at managing money. They just spend it. The women are more responsible. That's why microfinance will only work with women. So, but, but we want to help the men to change their thinking. Okay? So, so initially, in the first few years, we imposed some kind of savings program for all our people. Uh, and, and that helps them so that they can send their children to tertiary education. Primary is a guarantee, is, is taken, is, 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 we take that for granted, secondary we take that for granted. But tertiary education, for parents to want to invest in their children's tertiary education is still a challenge for us. To invest in their daughter's education is an even bigger challenge. But we have to drive that, we have to keep pushing that. And then we, with through the savings, we help them to start their own vehicles, and, with the, and a few of them start to own their own houses. And the reason for doing that is this. Firstly, it's very expensive living in the informal sector. You know, you and I are part of a formal economy, we go to our banks, we can borrow at sensible rates. But if you live in an informal sector, it is hugely expensive. Everything just costs more. The poor will always remain poor if they remain in the informal sector. We have to help them transition into the formal economy. When they start owning vehicles and start owning houses, they become part of the formal economy. They have an address, mm -hmm. right? they're starting to pay taxes of some sort, and more importantly, they start having a collateral because when they go to the bank and say, I want to borrow for my daughter's education, first question they ask is, do you have any collateral? I've got a car, I've got a house, right? I've got collateral. Do you have any credit history? Yeah, the, you know, I've been in this job for the past three years, and this is one month. They don't need any more help. They are now part of the formal economy. Mm -hmm. If we are serious, if we are serious about helping the then my view is that we need to help them start to own some assets, start to become part of the formal economy. Otherwise, it just gets to its end. There's something else that, that, that I learned. Role models. One of the things we find in many parts of, of Africa is simply this sense of hopelessness. You know, when you have had generations of the generations of unemployment, you know, there's a sense of openness. We, you can come into some of our towns where 80% of the adults are employed. They sit around, they wait for the pensions checks for their grandparents or their parents to come through. They're into drugs, they're into alcohol. It's a real sense of just hopelessness. And one of the ways to lift them is by giving them role models. This is Jake's Harbour. Jake's rose to be um, Nelson Mandela's chief of staff, when Mandela was president, looked after Mandela's affairs, but then Mandela was in, in jail, headed up uh, the Mandela Rhodes Foundation, Mandela's Children's Foundation. But you know what? James's parents grew up on a farm next door to us. Still buried there, their graves are there. So when James retired and bought a house back in our district, I went straight for James. I said, Jake, you got to come and help me to inspire our young people. Because if someone like you, from here, can rise to high office, there's hope for all our kids. The, 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 the place of, of, of role models is just so important to give people, especially our young people, a sense of hope. You know? So, so, so when, when, whenever we, we, we get into uh, investments, more, we also think about who can be the role models to come and inspire uh, children? Uh, let me skip some of this stuff because it's, uh, you know, we, we can spend all day talking. We have a foundation there. Uh, I fenced up about 1,500 acres to put non dangerous animals on because I discovered very early on most of our African kids have never seen 
wild animals in the wild.